Welcome to the Oral Apothecary Podcast, authentic chat about medicines, pharmacy and healthcare in the UK. Pharmacists Jamie, Gimmo and STC take on topical and controversial stories, but keep it edgy yet light-hearted. Guests share their career-defining drug, song and book, and also share their joyful patient stories. Welcome to the Oral Apothecary Podcast. My name is Jamie Hayes. For our opening episode of Series 6, we're joined by Rory Kettlin-Jones. Rory was a reporter for the BBC for 30 years. Now he's one of the co-hosts of Movers and Shakers, a podcast about living with Parkinson's disease. Recorded in a pub in Notting Hill, it puts our virtual pub-based CPD firmly in its place. We will welcome Rory in a moment as he shares a drug for our formery. Some call it a desert island drug, but not us. His career anthem and recommends a book for the Oral Apothecary Library. For our micro discussion, we look at the report titled, I love the NHS, but the report looks at how we can prevent needless harms caused by poor communications in the NHS. But first, let me welcome my two fellow apothecaries. STC is in Bournemouth and Gimmo is in Cardiff. Welcome both. Evening. Happy New Year. Yeah. Series six, who would have thought? I know, <laughs> not me. <laughs> <laughs> who would have thought? Yeah. Busy week as well we've got, haven't we? Two recordings this week. Yep, and it's um it's the junior doctor strike today in Card in Wales, so well, it's um it's it's been a busy day in the NHS. Every day is busy in the NHS. <laughs> yeah, well, true for us true. clinicians, anyway. Right, <laughs> so I want to say one thing. So the last working day of 2023, I received a letter about a frail elderly patient in their early 80s who had been to the cardiology clinic, as you know, my favorite single organologists. And I was blown away, so blown away that I sent an email to the pharmacist who works in the clinic and said, can I just say that this letter is the best letter that I have seen from the heart failure clinic? And please, can you use it as an appreciative inquiry to explain to everybody else why this is such a good letter in relation to an older frail person is in ideas about what we might start, what we might stop, what we might do first, what we need to monitor, and a kind of holistic approach to medicines for heart failure. So I was jumping for joy as I left the surgery on the last day of 2023. So there you go. Do you think you were just excited because it was New Year's Eve? (laughs) No, because it wasn't New Year's Eve. It was the day before that, wasn't it? But anyway, so yeah, I, I sent an email and said, can you, you know, just say thanks very much to the doctor that sent it. And perhaps we could, <laughs> I'm laughing now because when I mentioned this on the WhatsApp, Gimo said to me, I think that's a bit passive aggressive because yeah. I basically said, this is great because it's it's not like some of the one size fits all approach letters that we often get from this clinic. I haven't had a reply yet. No, I don't think you will either. Are you not going to read out the letter? No, we haven't got time for that, Rory. Positive and pacey on this. <laughs> you, you, you wind you wind us up by giving us this this tale of this fantastic letter that's better than any letter ever sent, and then yeah. you don't read it out. What's going yeah. on? Yeah, but listeners listeners will tell you, Rory, that I'm usually not very complimentary about letters from cardiology. So, you know, I, I was really taken with this one. Should we introduce our guest? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, at all. Let's move on. It's our great pleasure to welcome Rory Ketlin jones to the Oral Apothecary. Rory's full bio is available in the show notes, but here's a few snippets for you. Rory was a reporter for the BBC for 30 years, covering business and technology stories for much of the time. He joined the BBC as a researcher on Look North in 1981, moving to London to work as a producer in the TV newsroom and on Newsnight. His memoir, Ruskin Park, Sylvia, Me and the BBC, based on the thousands of letters he found after his mother died, was published in 2023 to universal acclaim from critics and readers alike. In recent years, he's investigated the role technology can play in improving the treatment of Parkinson's disease, having been diagnosed with the condition in 2019. In 2023, he joined with five other people with Parkinson's to launch Movers and Shakers, a podcast about living with the condition, which has become a surprise hit. Since leaving the BBC, he's become an independent technology consultant, writer and broadcaster. Welcome to the podcast, Rory. Great to be here. Sorry to have interrupted a bit early. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. So, Rory, well, congratulations on, on Movers and Shakers. Brilliant. Thank love you. it. We all love yeah. it. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I'm not sure how many of our listeners, I've mentioned to do a few of our listeners, and they've got back in touch to say that they love it as well. 
So I think after this you'll gain a f- you'll, you'll, get, you'll you'll get a bump in the charts after this goes out. I think, and so the or- as the oral apothecary massive moves on to movers and shakers, and and congratulations with the book Ruskin Park as well. Love that as well. That's really good to hear. You know, the new, the new series of movers and shakers begins in mid February, if we get our act together, uh, which is always a big if. Very <laughs> good. So after having listened to movers and shakers and both series, you've obviously gone into lots of discussion. Um, this is a medicines podcast, Rawley. Like, what out of those discussions you've had with your your fellow movers and shakers, what, what bit would you like to share with us about what you've learned from doing the podcast with them, really, and and the conversations and discussions you've had? Well, we've we've all learned an enormous amount, actually. I mean, I've learned far more doing the podcast than I've learned. Uh, to be frank, from 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 my doctors, although my doc- the two doctors I've had have been really good, but it, it's 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 made me ask all sorts of questions, including about the medicines I'm taking, which, um, and I blame Parkinson's. I I I, I forget this information about half an hour after, uh, uh, I absorb it. But um, uh, yeah, I've learned I've learned a lot about different aspects of the condition the fact that you know disease uh, uh, exercise can play an important part that nutrition can play an important part so it's broadened my horizons and it's also been incredibly gratifying to get lots and lots of letters emails from from listeners saying thank goodness someone's talking about this and we we, we're we're telling our own neurologists that um they ought to be listening to it too which is very gratifying one of the things i really like about it well there's there's two two things in what you said there there's there's this idea that we, with all conditions, we focus heavily on the medicines, and, and you know, you might think it odd for a medicines-related podcast. We we talk as much about the benefits of not taking medicines or alternative to medicines as we do about medicines. And it sounds like you've only really discovered that through talking to each other. But the second thing is this concept of of peer support and and what you've learned from each other, and that's why I I think your podcast is just a classic example of how you know if people with a shared interest get together and share knowledge it can have more benefit than than you know than talking to doctors and pharmacists yeah i mean i think we we've all learned that i mean but paul mayhew archer in particular is a great advocate of local groups and we're all a bit you know grumpy uh, about joining stuff uh, but but actually finding each other uh, because it all began in the pub where gradually half a dozen of us began to meet um has been enormously important we've we've basically formed our own support bubble as the the judge describes it and jeremy paxman is one of your get one of your uh cohort isn't he he's an interesting curmudgeon i think he would describe him himself as that himself as that wouldn't he jeremy a curmudgeon how can you possibly say that <laughs> yeah there was a fantastic moment in one of our uh episodes uh from the last series where he said um i i i, I think people like this podcast because we're all so cheerful uh, <laughs> and there was a moment's silence while we while, while we digested this because he is incredibly eeyore um <laughs> particularly about the drugs he doesn't think the drugs work <laughs> so two things there really look we um in october 2022 we invited jeremy onto this podcast <laughs> we, we we reached out and after having listened to both your series, I'm slightly relieved that he declined, <laughs> that he, he declined the polite yes. offer. But actually, on, on the podcast, he, he consistently asks the question, do the drugs work? Yeah. Doesn't he? Yes, he does. And that is a, it's a, it's a big question. Well, it's a, it's a bit of a question for me, partly from a good point of view, because in, in, in the early stages of Parkinson, of post, post-diagnosis, I... I didn't feel too bad and I thought I was coping pretty well and, and I was taking these drugs and I thought, do you know, I, I don't really feel any difference because I don't feel that bad anyway. Um, it's as time has gone on that I've begun to realise that, you know, towards the end of my four hour cycle, um, I'm getting pretty shaky and people can notice notice that. So uh, it's been a gradual appreciation of what the drugs can do for you. Yeah, and on the medicines episode, you mentioned, I think, that, that at that time you were on 12 tablets that take the burden you on a Saturday morning sorting them all out. Yeah, um, 
it's almost designed it seems to me to um wind up parkinson's patients who may not be the most dexterous of people trying to pop those pills out of those incredibly difficult um packages and and uh, i've got i've got a couple of pills of the, of, the, of the same variety one of which is four four milligrams and the other is two milligrams and it, annoyingly the two milligrams one is twice the size of the four milligrams one so i always get terribly confused and curse it and spill it on the floor and then think well the dog will probably end up um with dyskinesia because <laughs> it'll eat eat the tablets off the floor and that's sophie your your twitter star our incredibly famous dog yes <laughs> very good <laughs> but we we completely underestimate that and even on this podcast where we've talked about it time and time again we hear new stories like that rory where you know someone who's obviously got a science background will know that four milligrams is bigger than two milligrams and so we'll naturally assume that one tablet will be bigger than the other and it's yeah. it's those sort of confusions that we completely underestimate the impact of yeah yeah so rory i think one of the things that comes across when i listen as somebody who spent 25 years working in a hospital as a clinical pharmacist you know, on the wards and then seven years almost working in general practice is that I think that a lot of what you guys talk about in, you know, you want to be able to see more people or talk to more people who know enough about Parkinson's, if not specialists, to be able to advise you. And what I was thinking about when I knew you were coming on was this idea that I've been, I'm lucky, I've been exposed to and spoken to lots of Parkinson's patients. So I've seen, you know, understand the dyskinesias if you take too much levodopa based medicines. But I think for a lot of people that work in healthcare, because they haven't seen enough Parkinson's patients, they're not exposed to it. And therefore they, it's almost in the, it's in the too difficult box and they fear it a little bit as in generalists, I mean. Do you think that that's what is that your experience? Well, I think, yeah, I, the, the problem with Parkinson's is it's such a, a broad spectrum, really, of conditions. I mean, we're, we're all completely different, even amongst the six of us who meet in the pub. We've all got different things. Some of us have got tremors. I've got a tremor. Uh, some of us don't. Um, some of us, I mean, Mark Mardell, who, you know, is a great broadcaster, his voice is affected, which is, is is really tragic. My my voice, I keep worrying about that, but it isn't. Um, so it, it's not surprising that um, people find it difficult to get their heads around it. I mean, I, I, I was involved in a discussion a year or so back with uh, some very prominent kind of rock star American neurologist who said Parkinson's didn't exist in that it was not a useful definition at all and we should abandon the name which didn't strike me as particularly useful but um it is certainly uh, a, a very difficult to define condition and the other the important thing about it is how difficult it is to measure it um so you know we've got this sort of this UPDRS scale which is basically uh, walking up and down outside the consultant's office, um, opening and closing your fingers, getting up and out, out of a chair and so on, doing these exercises. And then they come up with a score and it all feels a bit random. Um, and, and, and unless you can measure it properly, you can't really tell objectively whether the drugs are working. Yeah. The other point that I was really going to make was that because the the incidence or prevalence isn't that great. As I say, you might only have a very small number of patients. So now in, in general practice where I work, I think I read it's about 0.3%, is it? So in a 20,000 patient practice, there's only 60 Parkinson's patients in the practice and therefore people don't come across them very often. And so when I think about it, you know, lots of other conditions. So rheumatoid arthritis, for example, has got a prevalence of about 1%, okay? But, but, in the world of of nhs if you're if you've got rheumatoid arthritis you have a special badge almost on the gp computer system that says that every year you need to at least have had an annual review and a couple of other things that fall out of that but we there's no such thing for parkinson's disease so we'll have them for rheumatoid we'll have them for you know people who've got heart trouble we've got people who've got so you, know, so you don't have a parkinson's health. register well, there may be one, but there is no incentive, in inverted commas, 
as in rheumatoid is the best example I can give you as a small, a relatively smallish group compared to all our diabetic and cardiovascular and asthma and COPD patients. But Parkinson's doesn't, hasn't got one of those. And I wonder if it suffers as a consequence. And this takes me on to my next bit, really, Rory, which is your last episode was quite heated, wasn't it? About how could you try and move forward getting a charter for Parkinson's yeah. patients? And and I, I wonder if I wonder if this is part of it because I don't think it's visible enough, if you see what I mean. Because I think that when I see a Parkinson's patient, I'm immediately I think of all the people I've seen, I know that they're multiple of things that I need to consider than I wouldn't in a in you know, in a different type of patient group. And I wonder if that is part of the reason why perhaps, you know, you, you don't get the uh sometimes the urgency and importance associated with it. Like the classic, you know not getting your medicines on time in a hospital, although I think hospitals have tried very hard in the last 10 years to to get over that. They might not be perfect at it, but I can tell you for that they've definitely worked on that in the last 10 years. But I just wonder, there's so many things that just, you know, perhaps slip through the net. Is there a question coming, Steve? Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to respond to that, Rory? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're debating... Uh, this this idea of a charter but i think the the key thing is making it more visible it's interesting i have just come out out of a discussion uh with somebody from the michael j fox foundation in america about what's happening in the us which is a national plan to end parkinson's which which sounds like a sort of crazy mission but actually the main point of it and it is has been almost initiated by the michael j fox foundation it is is to make the thing more visible um uh and to get lawmakers talking about it because unless people are talking about it um not much will happen uh i mean the the, the key th one of the key things for us is just the, the lack of neurologists uh in in terms of getting appointments for people the the, the worst thing i keep hearing is that somebody goes to their GP like I did with with a problem? The GP thinks it might be Parkinson's uh, and gets them an appointment with a neurologist. But that my my appointment took four months, which was you know standard. There are people who are being waiting a year or more for an appointment with a neurologist to get confirmed that they have Parkinson's, and I and that is completely unacceptable. And what we're seeing also is creeping privatization because we've, we've got a Facebook group uh, at, attached to the um, the podcast and a number of people have been discussing this, what to do. And lots of people are saying, well, it cost me 300 quid or whatever, but I just got a private consultation and that got me into the system. So that's not good enough. That's one of the things we we would definitely put in our charter if if we do come up with this charter. What did you think of the Michael J. Fox documentary? I thought it was great. Yeah, I, in fact, I reviewed it for the Today programme. So I I got a... Um, well, I interviewed the director and talked about it to, to him. Um, he's, su he's such an inspirational guy, Michael J. Yeah, Fox. I mean... I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. Part, partly, of course, it's the fact that remembering that he's now early 60s and... He's had it for 30 years and obviously he's, he's pretty seriously impacted by it, but he's still, he's still with us. He's still making yeah. an impact. And he's still fairly humorous as well with it as well. He's I, very I, funny. A, yeah, a few yeah. quotes I got from it. Um, his festival of self-abuse, because when he gets himself into some, you know, he falls and bangs himself. And, and then when he was waiting for his meds to click in, everybody around him knew that when he said, I'm waiting for the bus. Right, right. I'm waiting for the bus. And that was when... He was just waiting for the effect to take in, and then he'd tell people, oh, "I'm on the bus now," and he was, he was, he was good to go. So, yeah, no, I thoroughly enjoyed that as well. Um, still, it's called, cool, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Available on Apple. Because he's still, he's still Michael J. Fox. Can I just mention your book as well, Rory? One question. You can so, mention it several yeah. times, actually. <laughs> so, Ruskin Park. If you can see there, Rory, I've stickered up my book. Oh, he does this on all books. All he books, does this on okay. all books, Rory. So those those bits are significant bits for me, and they, they not those stickers there are the health related things that you mention in the book. So you mention your eye, and you also mention your mum being on oblivion. 
Oblivion. Oblivion. This, uh, this extraordinary. Actually, I hadn't thought before coming on this. I could have written a lot more about Oblivion. Um, so in the 1950s, when my my mother was, you know, having a, a great time in London, uh, having left her husband in Bristol and come to London with a young son, my half brother, uh, and working in the early days of television. Um, there seemed to be an epidemic of oblivion taking amongst the middle classes. And it was basically a, a, a tranquilizer. I, I looked it up, but it was withdrawn in the early 60s. But she she took one. Uh, she was ha had, having this affair with my father, uh, which is at the center of the book. Um, and he, he gave her an oblivion to take before her driving test to calm her <laughs> down. And then she talks about asking her estranged husband for a divorce and having taken an oblivion beforehand to pluck up her courage. So it was obviously a common enough drug. Did you, have you done some research around it? I did a quick bit and so came up with some photos from some of the museums. Um, take two to three capsules 15 minutes before an ordeal. <laughs> <laughs> an ordeal that's so, so when when there's an ordeal incoming <laughs> and and you're right launched in 1953 um what did we say it was methyl pentanol um withdrawn in 1967 when did mick jagger when did the stones write mother's little helper because that's about valium isn't it i was gonna say it got taken over by valium and Mogadon. Yeah, you know, that became yeah, the next yeah. generation of these but, are all the same yeah they're all for the same thing but I suppose from a medico history history point of view, you know, it's this idea of of mums having a tough time in the sixties and seventies and just being, you know, being given tranquilizers. And sadly, my my mum later on suffered depression and was on imipramine, which was I think was was probably pretty new in the early seventies when she was suffering yeah. depression. I don't know. Yeah, probably would have been. Yeah. Very good. But yeah, final plug for the book. Really enjoyed the book. And so would uh, we'll, uh, we'll share that. Available at all good bookshops if you pester them enough, is my experience. It's on, it's on Audible as well, which is where I, where I heard it. <laughs> the Oral Apothecary is sponsored by Jamie Hayes Executive Coaching and OneLessPill.com. OK, Rory, we might come back to some of these a bit later on when we talk about the micro discussion. But for now, we usually take our guests through three requests and the first one is obviously probably for us the most important because this is a medicines podcast but we like to call it a desert island drug although sometimes we're not allowed to but we are after a medicine or a drug that would evoke a powerful memory for you perhaps from your healthcare journey but perhaps not although I'm hoping that you're now not going to pick your mum's oblivion <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so what would you like to give us I, I, I wish I wish I had uh, thought of that beforehand because I've been uh, pondering this, I, I decided to go for one of my Parkinson's drugs, uh, rapinirol, because it's it's a fairly exciting drug, or it it sounds like it. Where, soon after I was diagnosed, and I was talking about to my doctor about what drugs to go on, she told me that she was considering putting me on what's called a dopamine agonist, uh, rapinirol. Uh, but but she what needed to warn me that there were potentially some quite alarming side effects. Um, it could cause obsessive compulsive behavior, which could be manic shopping, manic gambling, or could turn me into a sex fiend. So I didn't quite know what to think about this. Um, <laughs> you signed up immediately, didn't you? I signed up immediately. <laughs> um, and fortunately or not, it doesn't appear to have had um, uh, any uh, serious side effects, although maybe it's made me more of an obsessive social media user than before uh, updating twitter too often um so th that's rapinirol uh, and the other thing about it is i i i had to google it just before i came on because i always forget why i take these drugs i know about cinemet which is my basic dopamine drug but then what is a dopamine agonist and it's it's it turns out to be something that deals with the side effect of the the first drug you've taken and makes the dopamine absorb better or something like that can you, yeah, can you help me on that you're, you're enhancing the effect of the you know the cinema as you said has got some levodopa in it and it's the dopamine that you're lacking in isn't it 
And you talk a lot, you and everyone on the podcast talk about the possibility of the creative benefits of taking things like dopamine agonists, haven't you? Because some people yeah, get, very, get very creative. They get very creative without the obsessive compulsive bit, but it, it is a real thing. And you probably know that we also use it in people with restless leg syndrome. So they haven't got Parkinson's disease, but we use it in restless legs. And I'm always at lengths to try to point that out to people. But I guess it's slightly different to sell it for you know, a, a major neurological condition like, like Parkinson's, in other words, risks and benefits, whereas, don't get me wrong, restless legs might be terrible, but I'm not quite sure if it's exactly Well, I've, I've as... got restless, well, I, I don't know if it's diagnosed, but it's, it's, I, I sleep really badly, and one one part of that is sort of, sort of restless leg. Yeah, well, you'll be benefiting from the um, Rapinarol, because that's what would be used for restless legs. Yeah. Well, that's great. We don't think we've had a dopamine agonist before on the in the oral apothecary form. So, Steve, so Steve, how did you how would you explain agonist then to a, to a lay person? The idea of an agonist. I think that's what you were asking, wasn't it, Rob? Yeah, it, it's really just in an ag So you've got agonists and antagonists, haven't you? So if you think if you think about an antagonist, would stop the effect of the dopamine, and an agonist would try to amplify the effect of the dopamine. Does that does that make sense? So, so I take why why, why can't they all be in one drug? What, this is what I never <laughs> really understood. So you mean what we would call a poly pill? Yeah, why can't uh, I have um, uh, uh, a dopamine drug with um, with added agonist sauce? Yeah, that's it's a very good question. And uh, if a pharmaceutical company decided to to do it, because there are quite a few Parkinson's medicines that have got a couple of medicines in them, so. You know, you can get some that have got like three medicines in them, but there isn't any, as far as I'm aware, where the dopamine agonist is actually part of that group as well. I tell you, for I tell you, what I think is one of the reasons is that and with all combination pills is that a combination pill means that it's more difficult to keep adjusting the doses, which is often what happens with rapinarol. So you keep upping or downing the dose. So in other words, if you then had to interfere with the tablet that had the other medicines in it that were at fixed dose or whether they need to vary. So there's a trade-off between convenience of having it all in one and where you have the ability to be able to up or down the medicines accordingly. And it's the side effects issue too, coming to the yes. isn't it? You know, because yeah. there, there is a definite side effects. I, I I, I had been having Cinemet for, for a couple of years and then eventually my doctor put me on entacapone to go with it and then luckily managed to combine those two yes, right. to a drug yeah. called Zanic or something like that. Yes, Stanic. Uh, Stanic, Stanic, that's it. Yes, that's not, yeah, we have had a previous, one of our patients in Series 5 actually who's got Parkinson's and he was talking about that medication as well. So, yes, so you can get some combinations, but it's usually because of the you know, inability to adjust doses. Good answer, Steve. Good answer. So, rapinarol goes into the oral apothecary formulary. Thank you for that, Rory. The second thing we're after is a an anthem, a piece of music. Where it doesn't necessarily need to reflect your health journey, but it might, or, or an anthem of your life. What would you like to give us for the... It's on Spotify. We have an oral apothecary playlist and it's on Spotify. It's very, very eclectic. This is, is slightly random. It's, um, I've got staying with us at the moment um, uh, a man called Sai, who is our dog whisperer for our very nervous dog. Okay. Um, and he had never watched detectorists which is one of the, oh, the, 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 the most wonderful what a series the, what a series yeah and so over the last three three days three or four days uh he and i have sat down and binge watched the whole of detectorists so i'm i'm choosing the theme from that which is uh by a guy called johnny flynn it's just a complete earworm um and uh, it's not really anything to do with my health journey except that it's good for my mental health uh, that program, I, I, I go back to that program if I'm feeling down because it is it is just a joy. It's a comfort blanket, isn't it? I know exactly what you it mean. Is. It's a bit yeah. like the Gavin yeah. and Space, Gavin and Stacey Christmas special, and he's he's the man of the moment, isn't he, Toby Jones? He certainly is. Yes, <laughs> yes. Maybe maybe that's what you need is a is a is a TV program with a 
with a sort of sympathetic Parkinson's patient in it. I don't think I can't think of one if there's been one. Well, no, we we, we were thinking of doing an episode on the Parkinson's in in film casualty on, <laughs> on well, Holby there, City. There was there was a sort of um, thriller detective thing that ITV did last year, and it didn't. I don't think it got anywhere um, with uh, somebody who had Parkinson's. So it isn't the first time that somebody's picked a theme tune to a TV program. Uh, Jamie, Gimmo, can you remember what it was and who it was? It, was it the London Marathon one? It was. Um, okay, yes. By yeah, Tracy uh, Lyons. Yes. And we talked about global health. Yeah. So, but we definitely will take that. So that's the theme music to the, the Detectorist by Johnny Flynn. Now, I look like on the Zoom that I'm the only one that hasn't watched The Detectorist. Oh, you're in for a treat. You're in for a treat. <laughs> so I shall rectify that. Oh. And the third thing, Rory, we are after a book for the Oral Apothecary Library. So what would you like to offer us? Well, this is a novel by uh, Linda Grant, who's a great writer, really, really great fiction writer. Uh, and she wrote a book called The Dark Circle, which uh, was in the 1950s. And most of the action takes place in a sanatorium, a TB sanatorium. So... Uh, and I think streptomycin is is a character in it, so I thought that was really really appropriate. Um, and it's 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 a really good read. It, it's, it sounds quite dark, but it is a very jolly read. And really, a lot of my book, my my memoir, Ruskin Park, is set in the nineteen fifties because that's uh, where um, my my mother's life became more more interesting, uh, particularly around the crisis of my birth. So uh, I, I really enjoyed Linda Grant's uh, vision in the 1950s set, set in this sanatorium. Um, I was, a, I, I studied German at university and uh, of course the great, the great book of that kind is Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain, but that's a, a bit of a heavier read than uh, Linda Grant's. And not about medicines. That's great. You got one about medicines in. Yeah, we've had a we had a similar book. We had um, Albert Camus, the plague, didn't we? Which is um, oh yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah we we did. On a, on that a was from a, line. that was from a palliative care consultant. Yeah, in Cardiff. Very good. So the dark circle. So it was written in the nineteen fifties. You say no, no, it? no. It's about the nineteen fifties. It's written quite oh, the recently. Oh, about the nineteen fifties, yeah, but it was written. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's set in right. the nineteen fifties. On the subject of books, then, Rory, a couple of things. In your memoir, you point out that there weren't a lot of books during your childhood and growing up in the house. Is that was that? Did I remember well, that well? We, we I grew up in this flat, this small council flat, and um, there just was not much room. And my my mum had had some books, but they didn't change over <laughs> over time. Um, and uh, I. I used to go to a local library and I think I exhausted the collection of the very thin collection of, of that. After Lady a while. Bird books. Lady Bird books. Yeah. <laughs> no, I had some box set. I had a, my godfather was this wonderful poet, Jeffrey Grigson. And he and his wife used to send me those puffin box sets. Yeah. Yeah. Of books. Very good. The, the E Nesbitt books and the Narnia books every yeah. Christmas. And then one final thing on a book theme you have, I think, um, a similarity with one of our previous guests who has also written a book. So Dr. Lucy Pollock was series four, episode one, I think. And Lucy went to deepest, darkest West Wales to write her book. And am I right in thinking that you wrote your book overlooking Cardigan Bay? Is that where I... Well, I, I, I've spent the last five years in the same... Uh, Airbnb place overlooking Cardigan Bay in a little place called Trescythe. And yes, uh, m both my wife and I have often spent large amounts of the holiday <laughs> writing books. Uh, you know, only, only a, you know, you, you don't get a book written in two, a week or two, but um, it's, it's a, a, a place where you can take some time and look out at the sea and get on with it. A ship in in Trescythe. That's right. Yeah. yeah, there, yeah in fact, there's a ship in. There are two ship ship ins. 
uh, there, there's because there's one in uh, Aberporth, which is a, sh a short walk down the coastal path. The Aberporth one is a better pub, <laughs> but don't, don't tell the Trasyth one. Very good. Should we move on to our micro discussion next then? Yeah. Looking at the report, I love the NHS, but a collaboration between Engaged Britain. Now, how did you pronounce it? Demos. Did you? Uh, Demos. Demos yeah. and the Patients Association and the PMA. Here's an opening quote for you. It's a bit of a toxic relationship. I love our NHS. I will stand up for it all day long. But at the same time, I understand that it's quite damaged. And I think that's what comes out from your podcast, really, Rory, as well, isn't it? The the the, the damaged nature of the system. Yeah, I seeing mean, you, seeing your neurologist once a year. I, I think more to the point is not, is an experience I had a few months ago, where I had a very bad fall, um, and uh, fractured my elbow, and uh, was taken to A and E at our local hospital by my wife uh, and then had a terrible week where they f they kept failing to operate on me for various reasons and they made a terrible mistake sending me home with an open fracture um, without antibiotics and um, you know uh, not not at all a good experience and what what that what that experience told me in and out of the hospital uh, late at night was that the NHS had huge problems communicating with patients and between hospitals and between staff in the hospitals, between doctors and nurses. Um, and, and something needed to be done about that. Which it mentions in the report, isn't it? It, talk, it talks about communication, but a lot of it is actually about coordination as well isn't it and how how the different parts of the service sort of work together yeah i mean what one extraordinary thing is how long for example it takes to get discharged from a hospital because I, I i was in the hospital waiting for an operation which didn't happen and eventually they decided i could go home they decided about lunchtime and then it was you know tea time before i was allowed out as it were because somebody had to print something off yeah. um and it, it just was come on guys this is not not difficult and and um, when you did your episode on the charter i mean it was clear that you'd been given all of you i, I said this to boys i didn't mean it in, a, in an insulting way there's a bunch of really clever people around that table and and it's clear from when you listen to the charter that still struggling with the things that you've been told and not either not fully understanding the information or not putting the various bits together. And that's what got me thinking is if is if a bunch of intellectual heavyweights who are meeting regularly are struggling to understand what you've been told, what chances is there for the for the rest of the world? Um both in terms of us getting it wrong and and you you people, you guys trying to understand it. That makes sense. Yeah, and actually, we we are the lucky ones, as you said. I mean, we we, we heard we we did a program on breaking the bad news. Um, doctors, um, you know, telling you you've got Parkinson's, and we'd had a mixed bag of experiences. Uh, but some of the the stories told by our correspondents were extraordinary, and even the judge, the judge who's obviously a very self-confident figure um <laughs> was told by his consult consultant um uh oh the, the um it's it's likely that within five years you'll be in a wheelchair and he said well how likely and he said Oh, about 20%, one in five chance. And so the judge came back and said, well, that's unlikely then, isn't it? <laughs> you know, basic innumeracy right. on the part of the consultant. So that describing risk and benefit, Rory, is one of my interests over the years. And I spent a lot of time trying to teach it to healthcare colleagues. And it, teaching it is difficult. Um, it's one of those, it's a perishable skill. They go away from the course often sort of armed up thinking, oh, I can use these skills and I can... You know, I'm uh, use the numeracy in in describing risk and benefit. But if you don't if you don't use it, you you lose it. And so that's an example there that 
you know, learning it is one thing, but then actually applying it in practice with patients is is another another level then as well. I, I can imagine that. And some, some people will want information, uh, as much information as possible, and some people really won't. So uh, you have to... But it's even it even patient. that even that example of you'll be in a wheelchair. That's that's not actually what he's saying. What he's saying is that you know there's a chance that Parkinson's will have caused you some mobility issues or some weaknesses that may lead to that. But how people hear that is, you know, they'll respond to it completely different because it means something different to every single person, doesn't it? Yeah, I had another letter last week from a chap who was diagnosed at. 48 uh, earlier this year uh, no, la last summer and he was told well you've got five good years and then you'll be unemployable um and he was horrified and got himself a second opinion for a consultant he says that's nonsense you know the most important thing at this stage is positivity and um yeah, people who manage to keep on working for a long time can I just say for the listener, in case you're wondering of what this document was actually talking about, it was quite a lot of work, actually. They did some citizens' assemblies. They spoke to members of the public and got them into citizens' assemblies. They did polls and things. And it included people from the Patients' Association. You might remember we had the Patients' Association uh, chief executive on uh, last series. And they also had the uh, some people from the, the sort of the association of practice managers, essentially primary care managers. But they did quite a lot of work to try to get this information out. And they basically distilled it down to three things they said about poor NHS communication. One was difficulty accessing or navigating the health system because it is unclear what communication to expect or who to communicate with at different points a lot of the discussions. Two, administrative errors creating inaccurate or erroneous communication leading to problems with care, treatment or expertise. I think we've covered that. And three, staff not being able to communicate internally or advise on next steps to patients because they don't know or understand enough about that person's medical history, which I think we've Absolutely. also talked about. And this is something I write about too, in terms of easy ways for, for, for both patients and doctors to access information. Now, the, I, I have had three involvement with three different sort of areas uh, over the last 15 years. I've got this uh, malignant melanoma behind my left eye, which is being treated by Moorfields. Uh, I've got Parkinson's and then this, this uh, fall I had. And they're all in, in, in silos. They don't exchange information. That is beginning to get better with innovations like the NHS app, which I'm now a huge enthusiast for. Uh, and two of my various appointments end up on the NHS app. And the third doesn't because they've somehow not signed up to it, which I find annoying. But uh, um, I think we there are great possibilities of better communication through that sort of system uh if only people would get on with it yeah let me get right behind that rory um i one of the positive things i think that 2024 can bring in the nhs and there aren't many <laughs> is the nhs app in relation to prescriptions and medicines okay there's a massive um, upgrade coming in relation to the nhs app so we need to do everything that we can to get people to use the nhs app not just in like you said about knowing when their appointments are and being able to see what's in their notes but from a prescriptions point of view you'll be able to see you know has it arrived at the gp has it been issued by the gp and now it's sat in the queue at the pharmacy here's the barcode for the for the prescription if you if it's one of these out of stock medicines and you can go shopping somewhere else so it's got huge potential because that not only is that good for the patient but there's a lot of inefficiency that happens within the system because of the nhs you know problems around <laughs> supply of medicines and what we call you know prescription uh, prescription tennis really with people looking for medicine so that is one of the solutions from this report is to increase the uptake of the NHS app. So if we can all get behind that, that would be great. Uh, well, I, for the first time this weekend, um, uh, did my renewed prescription Very good. via the NHS app. So um, let's see when it's... Oh, yes, yes. It's going to be arriving. You might not have the most, the most... Up, the most <laughs> up-to-date upgrade I think is coming at the end of this month Rory and all those extra features that I just talked about will actually be on it 
So yeah, let's get behind the NHS app because it is certainly one of the ways that we can improve communication. I mean, the boys will know I've often said that the big C in healthcare is not cancer and it wasn't COVID. It's always been communication in my book in the 32 years I've spent in it. And the number of times that, you know, it's quite obvious that nobody's looked at the person's notes before the person's come through the door. And that's so infuriating to the patient, isn't it? Now, listen, this is interesting because there's a story in the papers today about shortages of some medicines. Um, and two of my medicines, it says, uh, cannot uh, cannot order medication until two days from now. Last request. All right. Mm, interesting. Um, so, some Parkinson's drugs have been in short supply, I know. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we can all get behind the NHS app. And again, just for the listener, the other two things that it talks about how to try to deal with this problem is one is what they call care navigators. So these are non these are non healthcare prof- these are not clinicians but they can help patients navigate support nhs services a little bit like social prescribers but perhaps a bit more than that and and the other one is clinician based which is what they call care coordinators and these are clinicians so it might be a nurse it might be a gp could be a pharmacist who works in general practice about improving access to um clinicians with oversight which is what you're talking about Rory so you've got oversight of people with multiple conditions so that they're less likely to be dealt with in a siloed way and my best example of this would be anybody that knows anyone with serious mental health conditions they have a CPN I they might call it something different now community psychiatric nurse and part of their role is to do that coordination of other things because they need that assistance well I think that was one of your things in the charter wasn't it Rory was Parkinson's nurses yeah, yeah. And can I, can I, maybe me laugh, you talked about care navigators. I, I think one of the big problems is literal navigation, um, finding a way around a giant hospital. And I, I go quite frequently now to Northwick Park Hospital for physiotherapy. And I just wanted to, having been rude about some aspects of the NHS, there, there's a, a wonderful woman behind the reception desk, a middle aged lady, and two or three times I've gone and asked help for her from her and she's come out from behind the desk and walked me halfway to where I want to go and that sounds simple but it's that kind of person that makes a huge difference to how a person feels about the treatment they're getting um, because they are very confusing a, a lot of a lot of a lot of hospitals and and you know I was going to mention it when you were talking about the app that's my we do an episode, I think, on on the use of apps or something like that. But, but I, I worry about the use of apps. I think they're great, but there's a risk that they take away that human touch. And that I don't mean that from a Luddite point of view. I just mean that from, you know, for example, you can see now when you try and do anything with an insurance company or with, with a, you know, it's it's all automated. And it's, it's, it's for exactly the same reasons as we're talking about the NHS app. It's supposed to make things easier for people, but it often doesn't. So we do have to be cautious, I think, with our praise and with our enthusiasm for an app because it could easily go wrong, I think. Yeah, but when the alternative is is waiting on the phone to your GP surgery and not getting through, um, <laughs> an app is is of great use. Yeah, and I, I wrote about uh, some aspect of digital uh, medicine the other day and somebody made the very good point that yes there will always be uh patients for whom that's not suitable that you know that they they just can't use the technology but they if if most of us go digital there'll be more resources available for the the minority who don't they you know we won't be hanging on the phone uh and therefore they are more likely to get through yep absolutely spot on can i quickly mention my other not bug well it is a bugbear is there any other profession where uh the practitioners would be desperate to keep their contact details away from customers i always think the most valuable thing you can have is your doctor's email address which i'm lucky to, enough to have in two cases but not my gp um there, there's a desperation not to be contacted in simple ways by by customers We'll call you, don't call us. I thought most surgeries would, so the surgery I work at, there is a there is a surgery email address. Really? 
Yeah. Well, <laughs> not at mine. <laughs> don't give the patient your email address, so do you, Steve? Well, you say that. I have been contacted where people have gone on. You know, I've probably Googled me. And next minute, I have, I've had them sending me uh, an email about their care to my Gmail address. Yeah, that has happened. <laughs> so I... We've done some patient contact work in our trust and stuff, and it, and it, you're right. It's one of people's biggest frustrations is you know a letter will say something like if it'll be something simple like if you can't make your appointment, please contact us. Yeah, there's actually no physical way to find out who who to contact them and, and what the number is. So I think I still think that is a big big issue in the NHS. Okay. Thanks all. A big thank you to Rory for joining us on the Oral Apothecary and for sharing his stories, his Desert Island Drug, his career anthem and his book for the Oral Apothecary Library. Coming up next time, we'll be joined by Professor Bapu Jenner. Bapu is the Joseph P. Newhouse Professor of Healthcare Policy at Harvard Medical School. He's an internist at Massachusetts General Hospital and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. As one of the small group of physician economists in the world, Dr. Jenner uses creative natural experiments to help us understand how healthcare works. He is also host of the Freakonomics MD podcast, which explores the hidden side of healthcare, and he's the author of Random Acts of Medicine, the hidden forces that sway doctors, impact patients, and shape our health. Join us next time on the Oral Apothecary. You can contact us via Twitter at Oral Apothecary. We're on LinkedIn. You can email us, oralapothecarypod at gmail.com. Not forgetting the website, theoralapothecary.com. Gimo now for the final ingredient. Okay, so thanks thanks for that, Roy. That was fantastic, and it's, it's been a real pleasure to meet you. Um, I know from listening to your podcast that mental health is a big issue for people with Parkinson's disease, in um, particular depression and anxiety, and according to the Parkinson's charity website, at any given time, up to 40% of people with Parkinson's will either have will have depression and 31 percent will have anxiety i don't want to make light of that but is it possible that these symptoms might be worse today than on any other day of the year do we know what today is oh this is nonsense this yep, is um, it's blue monday, blue monday. it's which blue is monday, a, yeah. a, mar- a marketing wheeze by yeah. holiday companies oh you stole my thunder there we go so <laughs> so it's a day in which according to a scientific formula um combine to 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 come up with this formula that today is the worst, but you're right. It was a, it was a, a marketing ploy by by a travel company to sell, to sell more holidays. I mean, we do know that it's a more depressing time of the year, particularly for those affected by seasonal affective disorder. But but Blue Monday isn't real. But I did want to finish with an idea from a recent study um, from the University of Edinburgh that might be of interest to you, Steve, because we, you're in your lycra now. We can all see it. Um, and according to the research... Can't unsee um, it. I know. It's actually one of his better tops today. It's less revealing <laughs> than usual. But according to the research by the University of Edinburgh, those who commute to work by bike recorded greater reductions in mental health issues. They found a 15% reduction amongst those people who'd cycled to work for five years in prescriptions for depression or anxiety. Um, and in fact concluded that an investment in cycling infrastructure could have a positive knock-on effect for the mental health of the whole population. So so there you have it. If you do want to combat Blue Monday, get on your bike. Sound engineer, Jimbo Slough. Original music, Jamie Brewster. Artwork by David Baker. Thanks for listening to the Oral Apothecary Podcast. For maximum effect, instill weekly. This episode of the Oral Apothecary is sponsored by onelesspill.com a medicines optimization consultancy. Mm-hmm.